Southern Colorado's Rock Alternative, 97.7, the Academy, Con Man, live and loud. And, man, I tell you what, I got such a cool guest this morning. Today, we got a NASA astronaut in here. He's a 98 Academy grad. He spent a lot of time recently on the International Space Station. And uh, what's interesting about my guest is his first launch into space was aborted shortly after takeoff, and the man actually walked away to tell the tale. Ladies and gentlemen, can you believe it? We've got Colonel Nick Haig in here from NASA. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. It's uh, awesome to be here with you today. Man, it, you I, I can't believe you've got any energy left, Nick. I know they've been pulling you apart. You were just talking about it off the air here, the fact that you've gone over to Schriever, you've been to Peterson, you've been here at the Academy. You're really yep. telling the tale. Up to Buckley, too. Made the, uh, the whole <laughs> round trip. I uh, just want to get out to all the space wings. Uh, in the Space Force and, uh, you know, really just personally thank them for everything they did to support our mission on board the International Space Station. Yeah, man. And and there's so much support, so many man hours, so many people that uh, make those things successful at what they are. Yep. Uh, you know, one of the big things, obviously, you're here talking about what you've done in the space station, but you're uh, here being awarded for the Jabara Award. Yeah. And what a huge accomplishment that is, being an Academy grad and being uh, bestowed this honor. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's cool. It's uh, I got to kind of pinch myself every now and then. Yeah. I'm a little shocked. Uh, at the, to get this kind of recognition, I, I don't know exactly what I did. <laughs> I, I guess I sat on top of a rocket that blew up. Yeah, right, but you walked <laughs> away. You, what was cool about, uh, I mean, you're being honored for an extraordinary professionalism and heroism. The fact that you held it together as this thing was coming apart, you guys eject, right? Or, yeah, or so, jettison. So, so the capsule just basically, there's some rockets on the very top of the capsule, and it rips us off the rocket as the <laughs> rocket's kind of tumbling through the air. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're falling back to Earth in, in a 7G spin? Yeah, so it, we, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you prepare for something like that? Because you're going through a checklist trying to perfect your landing while spinning in 7Gs and uh, reading all this in Russian? Yeah, so we launched on a Soyuz rocket, so everything's in Russian, okay. uh, even the procedures. So <laughs> uh, all the radio calls, uh, I spent uh, the better part of the last seven years trying to master that language. I, it continues to this day, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what goes through your mind? Uh, you, you don't prepare in that instant, right? right? Right. That preparation started back when I was a cadet at the academy. Exactly. You, you build a, a, a mindset, a lifestyle, a, a structure to the way you approach problems and, and, a, and a way to rely on, on teammates and, and all those core values that you learn at the academy. You take that through your career, and then, and, you know, and then I applied that in flight test engineering. And, and so all those experiences build off each other. That wasn't my first in-flight emergency, sure, right? Sure, So, So when it happens, you just revert back to all that training that you've had before. I revert back to the hours and hours that I spent shoulder to shoulder with Alexei Evchenin, who was the cosmonaut that uh, was my commander. Right. And we knew each other so well at that point that I didn't need to see his face. In fact, you can't see each other's face wow. when you're sitting in that capsule because you're in there so tight. I could hear exactly what he was – I knew what he was thinking without him saying it. And and in his radio transmissions, based on the inflection in his voice, I know how he's doing. Yeah. You, just, you know each other that well. That's how you prepare for something like that. Yeah, and like you said, you just revert back to training. You're, you're constantly doing the same thing. You just go back to what is you're – not, you're not thinking about – possibly the end of your existence you're i mean did that well, cross I mean, your mind well i mean the reality is you know that the end if it was going to be the end would have already happened okay right? okay so we're we're as the abort is happening and you know abort's kind of this nebulous term as the rocket's disintegrating <laughs> at that point we were about 30 miles above the surface of the earth and we were going 4,000 miles an hour wow and and so everything happens fast at that speed so it was within a quarter second that Everything happened. The, the booster collided, and we were pulled to safety all in a quarter second. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I, I just can't even imagine. So, you, I mean, after you've recovered, you're, you're alive, you're on the ground, yeah. uh, you know, I, you then start preparing for the next launch. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was just a few months away when you relaunched again. Yeah, five months later, I was strapped into a, a, the same type of rocket on the same launch pad headed to the same station. But now the, the the stress has got to be twice what it was, right? I mean, are you thinking about the failures early on, not necessarily yours, but the equipment failure? Uh, are you thinking about that? No. You, to be honest, no. Okay. Um, every launch has inherent risk to it. 
And so I approached, uh, you know, my wife, uh, she's active duty military. We, we approach that first launch the same way we approach the second launch. Okay. Um, it's risky business. Sure. And so then you get down to the reason, well, why do you take the risk? Yeah. And it's because you believe in the mission, right? And so the mission is the human exploration of space. You're up there on the International Space Station. I'm working shoulder to shoulder with, with astronauts and cosmonauts from across the globe. And we're trying to perform scientific investigations for the betterment of humanity. You to bet. make life better on the ground, to help us figure out how to explore deeper into space. And so it's, it's a noble mission. And it's worth the risk. Isn't it amazing how all these nations can work so closely together in the International Space Station? But it seems like with everything else going on, nobody can agree on anything. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's magic, yeah, right? Yeah. Everything is so complex. But this one common interest in the exploration and discovery uh, and the potential to impact everybody for the positive pulls us together like that. That's that's the magic of you space. You bet it is. Exciting. Uh, you, I, you, you said you, you weren't even really thinking about it the second time around. Would you consider yourself to be an adrenaline junkie? No. I mean... Are you a pretty safe guy I outside did, of the cockpit? And I did, I, you know, I did jump just down the road. I did my five free fall jumps, <laughs> yeah. and, and that was enough. And that was enough, okay. And that was enough, so I don't go thrill-seeking. I don't ride <laughs> okay. motorcycles because, in my opinion, they're a little dangerous. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah, I, I manage risk for a living. <laughs> right. Well put, man. So after you finally get up there, you did two full missions uh, on the space station, right? Yeah, so expedition. So expedition. Each, each expedition is really a, a composite of crew and so for the last 20 years we've had somebody living on the space station okay. continually mm -hmm. and so every three months the way it's set up right now about every three months three people launch and they replace three people that were up there okay and so you just have this slow churn of every every three months there's a new combination of six and we name those expeditions and so i was up there for expedition 59 and expedition 60. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. uh, just to look back now, and what, what mission are we getting ready to launch into? Uh, right now, it's Expedition 62 on board. Wow. And, uh, you know, I've got great friends, Drew, Morgan, uh, Jessica Mir, and, uh, and Alex Kropochka are up there, and, and they are, uh, you know, they are, uh, they're having the ride of their life. I heard uh, on the news just yesterday, uh, one of our NASA astronauts, one of the females, uh, just uh, broke a world record. Is that right? You betcha. She was my crewmate, so <laughs> Christina so, Cook. I, Christina she Cook. She launched with us the second time. Wow. So the first time it was just a two-man mission, so they figured they needed to add a rock star to the crew <laughs> in order to make it successful, so they added Christina, and then she is such of a rock star. She, When we came home, she stayed on, so she was up there for 328 days. Wow. The longest mission any woman has ever done. And she came back, and if you see, anybody sees any video of her getting out of the capsule, yeah, she that. looks like she wasn't phased at all. So that's, that's amazing. That, that's Christina. She's just awesome. But, you know, seeing her come out of that capsule like you uh, and coming back from space, I mean, that's, that's a lot for your body to acclimate to right there. It is. It is. I so. mean, from zero gravity for over a year to all of a sudden, like, man, I need to lose some yeah. weight now. Yeah. <laughs> so, a diet. You, you know, they've got, they've got the countermeasures in place. We've been doing this for 20 years, right? So we lift weights, and we ride the stationary bike and we run on the treadmill for all that yeah physical activity two and a half hours a day wow every day wow so that's the, you're the, keeping keep, up you keep yourself strong you keep your heart and lungs strong the thing that really is tough is balance ah uh, because your inner ear up yeah. on <laughs> orbit it's always trying to find down and without gravity up there to help it find down your mind just stops listening to it so when you get back down on the ground your mind still isn't listening to your inner ear. So wow. as soon as I stood up, I'd start to fall over. It took me about, I'd say, a strong two days before I could walk around without somebody, you know, there just in case. Sure. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, I mean, it's something a lot of us just don't even think about, certainly the inner ear. Uh, and when you, what would you say would be better? Uh, what do you prefer more, the, the liftoff or, uh, say, the reentry? What, what makes you feel a little more comfortable? Coming home? There, well, you know, so it, they're, uh, they're two unique experiences, sure. right? And so the psychology of it, the, the liftoff, the, you've got this whole mission in front of you and the anticipation of the mission, and, and so you're so focused on that. Um, and then coming home, you know, the focus is just getting back to your family. <laughs> sure. And, uh, you know, you've, the mission's <laughs> behind you, and now it's like, okay, we got this one last step. Let's do it. And they're both completely different experiences. The, the 
I'd, I'd say that launching feels like you're in a souped-up sports car and you just smash on the gas <laughs> and never let off. Yeah. And, and, and then all of a sudden, after about eight minutes, you turn off the engine and everything's floating. And it's and smooth sailing, quiet? It's smooth sailing. It? It's quiet. It's peaceful. Everything just kind of dances around on its own. It takes on a life of its own. Reentry is a different thing. That's like that's like a uh, I mean that's like being on a tilt a whirl at, yeah. the, at the amusement park. And as you're coming in, you know, the you slow down with the atmospheric drag, and so you get down pretty low, and the clouds are zipping by, and you really feel your speed. And then all of a sudden, flaming chunks of your heat shield are flying <laughs> by the window. That'd make you and, nervous. Absolutely, and you, you see it going, and then all of a sudden the windows char over, and then the chute opens up, wow. and you're on the end of the chute, and you're just whipping around, and it's a it's a pretty it's turbulent. A, it's a heck of a ride. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so what do you miss most about space? You're sitting around at home now on the recliner thinking about, man, I really like that. Anything come to mind? Yeah, so there's two things. Ah. Uh, the first one is the obvious one, the view. You can't beat the view sure. and the, the impact that that perspective has on you. Um, you know, the second one is flying. Yeah. You know, seven months, my feet didn't have to touch the ground. Amazing. Every time I went to get something out of the pantry and then needed to float across the module to add water to it so that I could eat it, I'd do a backflip. <laughs> yeah. You know, why not do a backflip if you can do it? Yeah. Or, you know, spin or twist and playing with things, just twirling them in the air. It's amazing. So I'm dying to know what, what food you were dying to eat or you were missing the most about being up there eating this powdered food mixed with water. and Yeah, absolutely. Bread. Really? Yeah. The carbs? Were you just <laughs> carbohydrate starved up there? No, there's plenty of carbs, but... There's no fresh bread. I see. Because we don't have a way to bake it. So uh, our bread up there is basically tortillas, lots and lots of tortillas, but just a nice loaf of bread was something that I was after. Do they, uh, the food that you've got during the duration, uh, is that something that went up with you initially, or is it something that they continue to restock on the space station? Yeah, so everything is, 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 you know, it's, it's like military meals, the military ready to eat. The meals, rations. Yeah, the yeah. rations. So the MREs. So it's similar in that, and some of it we can rehydrate. Some of it's just in packages and you reheat, but all of it's stored and it's shelf-stable for months, and so we have this supply up there of about six months. And about every month we get a new cargo vehicle that brings it brings up more food, more science, more clothing, all of that, so that, so that we've got it to last. The nice thing is each time one of those cargo vehicles comes up, they usually have a little bin of fresh something, fruit, fruits and oh, vegetables wow. okay. and, and crazy stuff that you wouldn't imagine that uh, you'd enjoy, but up there, it's just treat. So like a, a, a just a big raw onion. Yeah, really? And, <laughs> and on orbit, you'll eat it like an apple. No kidding? Yeah, just it, just because it's so different than any other flavor you've got up there, and it just, you know, raw onion just is awesome, or big heads of garlic. Wow. And, uh, and then, uh, the that yeah, it, it, you know, space has a smell. <laughs> I was going to say, I bet that capsule would reek at times. <laughs> Yeah, and luckily the systems scrub everything out pretty yeah, good. Right. <laughs> but, you know, fruits and vegetables, the, the, the fresh fruits, those were a nice treat. But you don't get much of it, and you stretch it out as long as you can. You know what you need to do now, man, is uh, make like a, an, an astronaut cookbook. <laughs> oh, trust me, there are some uh, interesting creations you come up with up there trying to uh, keep it interesting. I bet. I yeah. mean, just thinking of the things that I used to make in college, like cheese Whiz sandwiches and things like that, you know, uh, any 100 different ways to cook ramen. But, uh, yeah, you got a little creative up there. So uh, besides the cookbook, now, do you think you would ever actually uh, be part of an autobiography? I mean, quite a story already. But, uh, I mean, this is like just your second chapter in here. Yeah, you know, um, I'm kind of my least favorite subject to talk about. Really? So, okay. So the idea of, of writing a book about myself, just I don't see the audience out there. I okay. don't know. Yeah, I mean, but you have to understand the way that the public looks at you like a true American hero. Uh, yeah. Just so proud of the fact that you're an Academy grad, and, I mean, there's so much to your story. That yeah, I, I understand. It's still a little hard to soak in, though. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I mean, I'm, I'm used to dealing with rock stars all the time. that will go on and on and on about themselves, but, you know, dealing with military personnel, very, very different. Um, what, do you, what did you really learn at USAFA back in the day that you truly still apply in your daily life? I mean, there's there is so much sure. on so many levels, right? But uh, ultimately, it's just the the things that make you who you are that built your character. Uh, you know, it's it goes back to core values 
integrity and service and excellence and and you know you can translate those words into into others like you know honesty and i can trust you sure. and then service is about teamwork and excellence is just trying hard and you can you you continually try to translate those but they're applicable throughout your entire life and if if you take those and then build on them. There's just the snowball effect of, of the opportunities that open up for you. And so those that's the bedrock that everything is built on. And it's quite a foundation. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, 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 the type of cadet that comes to the academy in the first place is a unique individual. But be able to take those things and carry on throughout your course of life is, is pretty incredible. Well, you know, when you, when you show up and you're, you run it, you hop into beast and you get <laughs> broke down. I mean, the whole idea is let's break you down yeah. and build you back up. And, and then the whole intent of that is just to show you the power of those core values. And it gives you an environment where you can, you can exercise them and you can see, Hey, you know, this stuff is real. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you came to the Academy, was it always your goal to be part of NASA? Did you want to be a pilot initially and said, you know what, maybe this NASA thing is going to work out. You know, I when I when I came here, I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, it had always been a childhood dream. Wanted to be a pilot and and fly fighters and you know do kind of that stereotypical uh, image of what it takes to be an astronaut. Yeah. And uh, wasn't pilot qualified. Didn't graduate as a pilot. Okay. I went into acquisitions and ah. worked in a research lab. And and so, uh, if anything, I hope I'm an example for everybody out there that you know. Hey, just because the path you think you need to take right. in order to get to your dream uh, isn't available doesn't mean there's not a path. That's so well put, man. You you, were, you graduated in 98. Yep. Uh, you were uh, considered uh, the NASA astronaut class of 2013. Yep. I just saw in the news here not long ago, they announced the uh, new uh, NASA class of 2020. Uh, and uh, Raja, yes. who is uh, a former Academy grad, yes. he's going to be part of that. Are they going to, do you think, uh, is this the class that may be venturing towards Mars? Yeah. So, you know, this is the Artemis is the new program. Right? Okay. Okay. So Artemis and the target, the whole purpose behind Artemis is to get us to Mars. Okay. So to do that, Artemis is going to take us to the moon. And then 2024, we're trying to put feet on the ground on the moon. Wow. Um, you know, put the first woman on the moon. Wow. And and the way we're doing that is is the approach we're taking is trying to build out this proving ground so that we can test out all the things we need to test out, all that infrastructure. How are we going to shelter? How are we going to provision? How are we going to land? How are we going to do maintenance? All these things that we need to figure out how to do, we can do them on the moon when if something goes wrong, we're only a few days away from home. I see. Whereas if I try to do it on the surface <laughs> of Mars— it's like a nine-month trip, <laughs> right? And that's even if the planets line up. You may have to wait a year before the planets oh, okay. line up. So we need to figure it out here close to home before we start venturing out into the deep. You bet. Now, obviously, something that everybody is talking about lately is the new Space Force. And, yeah. you know, Space Command has been around since, what, the 80s? Uh, I know it was a hub here uh, in Colorado Springs at Peterson, I mean, it's it's. This has kind of been the area. Yeah. Uh, so the Front Range is uh, the nexus for space. Really. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, now, what's the difference between the old Space Command and the new Space Force? Yeah. So you know there are some differences, and so it, it you it gets into kind of the technicalities of of how we actually organize all the services. So there's there's U.S. Space Command, which is the combatant command. Okay. There and 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 then there's the Space Force, which is akin to the Air Force, I see. which is it is going to train and equip. It's going to try to provision to make everything available so that the combatant command, which is U.S. Space Command, can use all of that to perform the mission. I see. And so you've got a part that's in the planning and getting everything ready, and then you've got a part that's actually out there doing the job. Is that something you're going to be part of, do you think? Yeah, you know, so there's I, rumors. <laughs> yeah, so you know, there's opportunities there for sure. Uh, but you know, I think we need to we need to think about what NASA does versus what the Space Force does. And I so, see. So I am an Air Force officer, so okay. I'm in the Air Force right now, but I'm working at NASA I see. through an agreement between the agencies, and so I'm working for NASA. And NASA's mission is different than the Space Force, but I have to highlight, the, you know. 
we're here on the front range. There are so many things that the front range does, the Space Force provides, that protects us up there, yeah. that supports us up there, so that we can even do that human exploration mission. So they're, they're necessary. So we're different from the Space Force, but we depend on them for so much. We, need, we depend on them for, for GPS signals so sure. that we know, can you believe it? It's just like your car. Yeah. The space station needs GPS to know where it's at and how it's oriented. Uh, we need the we need the space force to track all the debris that's got so congested up there to try to keep us from running into it with the space station. And if there's going to be a collision, they can tell us in advance and we'll move out of the way. So they protect us. How much junk is actually floating around up there? I mean, if you guys really got to have somebody help navigate you through it, it's quite a junk field, huh? There, there is a lot of stuff up there, and I, so I got the chance to do. Uh, uh, three spacewalks while I was up there. Wow, magic, magical experiences. And one, you know, when it comes down to debris, uh, I'm hand over hand on handrails, looking at places where little specks of debris have drilled holes through the handrails as we've run into them. Wow. Because up there, you're going 17,000 miles <laughs> an hour. And so can you imagine a head-to-head -head impact with something yeah. going 17,000 miles an hour? The destructive power is amazing. Well, we can't track those little things. No. We can track the big things. And so that's what the ground does. And they, they track those big things, and then they help us move out of the way. Such an incredible opportunity to talk to you, Nick. You have seen so many things. Truly an American hero. We appreciate all your time, all your efforts. So proud of you as being part of uh, USAFA, but uh, also very proud of you for your achievements in space and the Jabbar Award, sir. Congratulations well, to thank, you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, to speak with you today. Yeah, thank you again, Nick.